read all these words together. Let's ask for God's spirit to fill us, to open our minds and our hearts to receive his word to us today. Our Lord and our God, now as we hear your word, fill us with your spirit. Soften our hearts that we may delight in your presence. Sharpen our minds that we may discern your truth. Shape our wills that we may desire your ways through Jesus Christ, our Lord, we pray. All God's people said, Amen. Isaiah 64, the prophet writes, Oh, that you would rend the heavens and come down, that the mountains would tremble before you. As when fire sets twigs ablaze and causes water to boil, come down to make your name known to your enemies and cause the nations to quake before you. For when you did awesome things that we did not expect, you came down and the mountains trembled before you. Since ancient times, no one has heard, no ear has perceived, no eye has seen any God besides you who acts on behalf of those who wait for him. You come to the help of those who gladly do right, who remember your ways. But when we continued to sin against them, you were angry. How then can we be saved? All of us have become like one who is unclean, and all our righteous acts are like filthy rags. We all shrivel up like a leaf, and like the wind our sins sweep us away. No one calls on your name or strives to lay hold of you. For you have hidden your face from us and made us waste away because of our sins. Yet, O Lord, you are our Father, we are the clay, you are the potter. We are all the work of your hand. Do not be angry beyond measure, O Lord, do not remember our sins forever. O look upon us, we pray, for we are all your people. Your sacred cities have become a desert, even Zion is a desert, Jerusalem a desolation. Our holy and glorious temple where your father, our fathers praised you has been burned with fire and all that we treasured lies in ruins. After all this, O Lord, will you hold yourself back? Will you keep silent and punish us beyond measure? This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Heidelberg Catechism, Lord's Day 24. There's three questions and answers, and as we've done before when we look at the catechism, I'll read each of the questions and together we'll respond with the answers. Question 62 asks, why can't the good we do make us right with God, or at least help make us right with him? Because the righteousness which can pass God's scrutiny must be entirely perfect and must in every way measure up to the divine law. Even the very best we do in this life is imperfect and stained with sin. Question 63, how can you say that the good we do doesn't earn anything when God promises to reward it in this life and the next? This reward is not earned. It is a gift of grace. But doesn't this teaching make people indifferent and wicked? No, it is impossible for those grafted into Christ by true faith not to produce fruits of gratitude. People of God. So as you've probably figured out by now, and if you haven't yet, I'm just going to let you know for sure, today is Mother's Day. Of course, this day has been set aside so we can take time to honor our mothers and show our appreciation for everything that they have done for us. At least that was the original intent when the idea of having a special day for mothers was first suggested by a lady named Anna Jarvis way back in 1905. However, the way that Mother's Day is often celebrated now, it's not exactly what Anna Jarvis first had in mind. For her, the main point of Mother's Day was to go out and actually spend time with your mother, if that's still possible, and if not, at least then do something to honor her, to, to remember her. 
Nana Jarvis actually got so frustrated with how commercialized that Mother's Day became, how it turned into just another what you'd call a Hallmark holiday. She actually tried getting it removed from the calendar. Unfortunately, that commercialization piece of it, that has had an impact on how a lot of people celebrate Mother's Day. And some families, instead of a celebration, it almost feels a bit more like a competition. Can you do something big, something dramatic to, to show your mother just how much you love her, or at least that you love her more than your siblings do? And so you get arguments like, well, I, I made mom a card. That's nice. I bought a card and a box of chocolates. Oh, well, then I'm going to make mom breakfast in bed, too. Well, that's fine. You can go ahead and do that. But I've already talked to mom about going out for brunch. Oh. Now, in a weird way, that's, that's kind of what we get, too, from the passage we read from Isaiah, from Isaiah 64. The prophet begins by asking God to, to do something big, something spectacular. Oh, Lord, if you would only rend the heavens and come down, come and make your name known. Make the nations of the earth tremble before you. Make them bubble and boil in fear like a pot full of water over an open flame. Basically what the prophet is saying is, Lord, please come and do something big. Show us you're there. Show us you still love us. Come and give us some kind of big, grand, dramatic gesture. It helps to know something about where this is all coming from, the context of these words. At this point in his ministry, the prophet Isaiah is, is looking ahead. He's looking into the far off future. He's looking at where does the relationship between God and his people Israel seem to be going? Where is it headed? And the prophet knows things are not going well. He just has this deep sense of it. He has spent most of his life already, Isaiah, trying to warn God's people that there is danger ahead of them. They, they are going to be attacked by enemies. The land is going to be invaded. They are going to be carried off into exile. And Isaiah had also tried to tell God's people, Israel, why all this was going to happen, and that it was because of their sin, because they had refused to listen to God and follow his commandments. God's people had turned away from God, and so God was going to turn his face away from them. Now, naturally, you do get this sense from Isaiah. He would love it. He'd love it if things would just be the way they had been before all this. And it's almost as if he is now reminding God, Lord, remember. Remember how you used to do all these awesome things, things that we would never have expected, not in a million years. You, you would come down to us, the mountains would in fact tremble before you. And back then it was pretty clear to everyone, to everyone that there was no God like you. You were the one God who would actually come, who would step in and save his people. We knew where we stood with you. The thing is, Isaiah also knows what happened after those days. He knows what went wrong with this relationship. He points out, God, you, you do come to those who do what is right, and you help them. You are still willing to rescue the righteous. But you, you got angry with us. We wouldn't listen to you. We just kept on sinning and sinning and sinning. And I realize, Isaiah realizes at this point, things do look pretty helpless. We have put all this distance between us and you, Lord. And it may be that we're, we're past the point of no return. And so how, how can we be saved? Isaiah, at this point, is almost imagining, wondering, is there something God's people could do? Is there something they could do to even just begin making amends with God? But the reality is there is nothing. There's nothing they can do that would help make things right again. As Isaiah says, we've all become like someone who is unclean, like a leper. All the righteous things we do, all our efforts to follow God's commands... 
They are nothing but filthy rags. We are like leaves that have shriveled up and faded. And our sins sweep us away like the wind. And Isaiah knows, he knows this isn't because God did anything wrong. God didn't let his people down. But Isaiah admits, we cannot blame you, Lord. We can't blame you at all for abandoning us for how you have just walked away. It's us. It's our fault. No one calls on your name. No one makes any effort to take hold of you. The Heidelberg Catechism, which we also read from, picks up especially on one thing that Isaiah says here in Isaiah 64 from verse 6 about how all of us have become like one who is unclean. All our righteous acts are like a filthy rag. When you really dig into that, you realize this is a rather unsettling image because Isaiah here, he's not just talking about old, dirty dishcloths. What Isaiah is actually referring to here when he talks about filthy rags, it's the cloths that a woman would use during her monthly period which, according to the law of Moses, that was a time when she was ceremonially unclean. And so Isaiah, he uses this very strong, very unsettling language, but he's trying to, to make something clear that even the very best that we do, it is not enough to make us right with God. As the Catechism says, even the very best we do in this life is imperfect and stained by sin. And I'm sure on one level, all of that makes sense to most of us here. It's not unfamiliar. A few weeks ago, if you were here, we, uh, we looked at the previous section of the Catechism, which talked about how we need to believe everything that is said in the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God the Father Almighty. I believe in Jesus, His only Son, and so on. The reason we need to believe that, as we saw, is, is we need to know all this in order to be right with God. The only way we can be right with God is by true faith in Jesus Christ. We can only be right with him by faith alone. And the thing is, that, that maybe sounds simple enough, that hey, all you, all you gotta do is accept this gift of God with a believing heart, just put your trust in him, and you're set. I think most of us know from experience too, it can be incredibly hard, incredibly difficult for us just to do that. All you gotta do is believe, really? I remember having a conversation with somebody once about a similar topic. They were discussing how hard it can be to, to sometimes believe, to accept when someone else says, you know, I forgive you, it's okay, we're, 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 we're set again. As this person said, it can be so hard to believe it when they tell you, you know, it's okay, they've forgiven you, they've moved on. I just can't understand sometimes how could it be that simple. I think that speaks to how most of us, most of us have this tendency, we want to try and do something when something's wrong. We want to try and do something to, to fix things. And the Catechism picks up on that as well, how we seem to be hardwired to, to think that way. Question answer 63, doesn't it say in the Bible that if we try our best to be good, that God will reward us for our efforts? In other words, isn't there something, something we can do still to try and make things right with God? The flip side of that kind of thinking is, is that it's easy for us to assume that if, if we don't do something, if we don't do something, then nothing is ever going to happen. We assume that things will not get any better between us and God if we don't start doing something, if we don't pull our weight. If there's nothing we can do to make things right with God, won't that just make people indifferent and, and wicked? And with all that in mind, then it's hard, it's hard for us not to end up feeling like we're stuck. The truth is we're the ones who sinned. We're the ones who blew it. And as much as we might want things to be right between us and God once again, there are almost times that there are times it almost feels as if God is up in heaven and he's just, he's done with us. 
doesn't want to deal with us. It's almost as if he's, he's listening to Taylor Swift and singing along. You go talk to your friends, talk to my friends, talk to me. But we are never, ever, ever getting back together. I apologize for inflicting that on you. <laughs> That is basically what Isaiah is getting at here. That sometimes it does almost feel as if God doesn't want anything to do with us anymore. And there's nothing we can do on our end really to change that. But you'll notice, you'll notice Isaiah doesn't just shrug his shoulders and give up and walk away. Because there's something he knows about God. There's something about Israel's God that has Isaiah convinced that, no, this cannot be where it stops. This cannot be all there is. Because Israel's God is not like us. We might abandon him. But he doesn't abandon us. It might feel like he is far away sometimes. But he doesn't ever completely abandon those whom he has claimed as his people. And there is the fact, for starters, Isaiah himself, he is doing precisely what he says nobody else is doing anymore. Isaiah is, in fact, calling on God's name. He is reaching out and laying hold of God. He's laying claim to all those promises that God made to incline his ear to his people, to be there when they cry out for help. And even though, even though it is Isaiah doing the talking, he knows this isn't coming from him. This isn't starting with him. He's already made it clear that, that none of us would go out of our way to seek God, not on our own. The process doesn't start just with us. It's pretty clear to Isaiah, where is this really coming from? If not from us, then who's inspiring it? And so the prophet, he stops asking God to make some big, grand, dramatic gesture. He stops lamenting about how God's people have been left to waste away because of their sins. Instead, he latches onto this, to the fact that, Lord, Lord, you still are our Father. You claimed us, even before we knew you, to be your children. We are the clay, you are the potter, we are all the work of your hand. You formed us, you fashioned us for your purposes. You still have a plan for us. And so Isaiah, he banks on the fact God will not let things go on. He will not let them continue like this. He knows that he can call on God, despite everything that has happened, despite all the things that God's people have done wrong. He pleads, Lord, please don't be angry with us anymore. Don't hang on to our sins forever. Look on us again, please. Look at the mess that we're in. Your cities have been destroyed. Your temple is in ruins. We don't even know where to begin, how we're ever going to put all this back together. We can't, not without you. And Isaiah, he counts on something else too. He also counts on the fact that God, God won't be able keep awake. He won't be able to stay away. God will not keep silent, not forever. It's kind of like with Joseph, when he couldn't help himself anymore. He had his 11 brothers there. He realized they had been changed. He couldn't hide the fact who he was from them anymore. I am Joseph. Is my father still alive? Like Joseph, God will not hold back forever. Even though it is obvious to everyone that, that not even the very best that his people can do will be enough to make things right again. God himself will step in and he will make things right because he has made it clear he will have a people. He will have a people for himself, a people who will be his forever and all time.
And that, that is precisely what God has done. He has not held himself back. Instead, God has stepped into this world, into its sin and misery. He sent his son, his one and only son, to be our savior. It's quite significant. At the beginning of Mark's gospel, in chapter 1, he tells us how the heavens were torn open, not to make the nations tremble, but so that voice from on high could confirm, you are my son whom I love. And we're told, too, how the Spirit then descends on Jesus. The Spirit fills him and empowers him so that by his death we might be delivered from death, so that his, by his blood we might be cleansed from that stain of sin, so that by his resurrection we might be raised to new life. As I mentioned before, this coming week we also observe Ascension Day. We believe Jesus is now ascended to heaven. He now sits at God's right hand, and we believe that he has also sent us the gift of his spirit, the comforter. It's that same spirit who came and descended upon Jesus, who is now at work in each of us, and all those who believe, producing fruits of gratitude in our lives. Now, it may not seem as if anything's really changed in us, we might wonder, what, what has God been doing in our lives? We so often want to see something big, grand, dramatic. We want conclusive evidence. God is actually there with us. But that's not necessarily what we always get. Sometimes what we get is, is much more quiet, much more subtle. But if we have eyes to see, we can still see God's Spirit at work in us and in the lives of those around us. For instance, I came across this story a while ago about this mom who, who decided to make a point every morning before she sent her son out the door to catch the bus, that she would sit down with him and take time to pray. She would pray that God would protect him, that God would bless his day, now, she was never quite sure how much of a difference this made to her son because he was often out the door before he remembered, oh yeah, mom wants me to stop and pray. She'd have to haul him back in. But this practice meant a lot to her. And one day, after she prayed with her son, she would sent him out the door to catch the bus. She was busy doing other stuff, and she heard the screen door open and slam shut again. She turns around, and there's her son, and there's some of the other kids who were supposed to be waiting for the bus as well in the kitchen together, and she's going, okay, um, you guys are back. Why? Your son explained, well, I told them, I told them how my mom prays for me before I go to school every day. And it turns out their moms don't do that. They don't pray with them. So we're wondering, would you pray with us now? Now, reality is it's just a cute little story. There's nothing really big or grand or dramatic happening here. But to me, that points to how God often is at work in our lives. We may not get anything big or grand or dramatic, but God still finds ways to assure us, to remind us, despite how lacking our best efforts are, things are, in fact, right between us and him once again. We have that assurance, not because of anything we have done, but God still finds ways to show us that his spirit, the spirit of his son, is at work in us, changing us, drawing us closer to him. Amen. Let's pray. Loving God, our Father in heaven, it is not the big dramatic things that we do that matter most. But it's what you do, Lord. It's the things that you do in our lives which are often too subtle for us to really notice, but those are the things that matter most. We're here because of what you have been doing, because of your spirit, how he has been at work in our hearts, opening our eyes to see that it's only through Jesus, through his sacrifice, that we can be right with you. 
Father, we pray if there is anyone here this morning that still thinks they have to do something, something big, something impressive to make things right with you, we ask that you would help them, help all of us to see that you've already taken care of everything. And all God's people said, Amen.